Good evening. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me to be hosting this seminar on the ELI project on rules of civil procedure, our project done along with UNIDWA, and I have Anna Veneziana here with me as co-chair. As we have been from the beginning of this project, uh, jointly chairing events uh, and seeing it through. Now this is really an amazing and perhaps a rather sad moment for both of us. Um, the end of a seven year journey uh, that sometimes seemed improbable, but always fascinating, always challenging. Because the rules have now been approved by the European Law Institute but they still remain to be approved finally by UNIDWA at their council meeting uh, later this month. So we're almost at the end. And therefore it's appropriate that we now share these rules with you um, for further discussion and hopefully uh, inspiration. For me, the project dates back to the time when I first became president of the ELI. And it seemed then an amazing project that was in an embryonic form, the brainchild of Anna and Christiana. And I had the privilege then to be a part to see it grow and to chair the meetings as we moved forward. And it has also been for me a privilege to be able to continue with the project after my um, presidency ended. And I thank Christiana and Anna for allowing me that uh, privilege. But it has been an amazing journey. We started with just a small structure group combined with some of us from the ELI and from UNIDWA. With Anna and Rolf Stirner from UNIDWA, with myself and John and Remo uh, Caponi from the ELI. And gradually the various working groups were formed and the work began. In a fairly small way at first it seems, I think we had just six working groups. But like most things, when lawyers get involved, it grows and it grows and it became more complicated. More working groups, and the need for a structure group to keep some sort of control and coherence about where we were going and what would be covered. And with the structure group, we brought in wonderful colleagues in Zandra Kramer and Lloyd Cade to help us with the construction of our civil procedure rules for Europe. If I may, I also remember from those early days, because we had meetings in Rome, meetings in Vienna, some in Trier, it has been quite a, a journey and a, 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 of international travel and friendships. But one of the things I remember and perhaps regret were a number of breakfast meetings in Rome with Geoffrey Hazard, who was of course part of the group that helped write the original principles of the done by ALI, the American Law Institute, upon which these rules are now based or take their inspiration. And I'm sorry indeed that Jeffrey is no longer with us and I would have liked to have thought that he could have been with us and seen this final uh, project with which in the early days, he certainly helped and assisted us. So for the project itself, I just want to make two points. It has been, for me as a previous legislator in the European Parliament, wonderful to see colleagues come together to produce a text of enormous length and complexity that will, I am sure, and we know it will because we know that both the Parliament and the Commission have followed our work, that this work will be an inspiration to the European legislature. We know that they won't take everything, but we know that some parts will be an inspiration and that the approaches and the rules within the work 
will give inspiration and guidance both to courts and judges and hopefully lots of food for discussion to academics. And in a sense, this was what the European Law Institute was founded to be about, to put inspiration for legislation on the table. And in this project, we have done it, I think, in spades. In terms of content, the one thing that has also intrigued me throughout um, sharing meetings that was sometimes a little fractious, sometimes difficult, sometimes a little tense. Yes, we had discussions between our various legal traditions, between progressive and perhaps less progressive approaches. Um, it has been quite something. But what was intriguing to me as a former litigator was the balance achieved throughout between the role or the autonomy of the parties and the role of the court. That tension and that balance, I think, is central to these rules and something of novelty in the way they are constructed. So those are the points I wanted to make in my opening, save for one last thing. We wouldn't be at this final staging post without the cooperation and help of many, many colleagues. Too many for me to mention now. But what I personally wanted to pay tribute to was the perhaps slightly unlikely partnership of Rolf and John over the last months and weeks of this project. And it has been amazing what you have done together um, to finally bring all the work to fruition. Your editing, yes, you, we have had constant drafts backwards and forwards, but it has been amazing. And your collaboration, your final collaboration has really made this project, as has the input of many, many other colleagues. But thank you both from me and I know also from to Anna? Hello. Uh, there was a momentary uh, failure <laughs> of connection and I'm very sorry. It might have been on, 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 on our part. Um, so I lost the last uh, few minutes, but uh, I would like to say good evening to everyone. And uh, I would like also to join Diana Wallace, my co-chair of this panel, but especially, as she has said, co-responsible in a way, an excellent partner in this long, challenging, but very rewarding journey in welcoming you all to this webinar and especially in thanking our distinguished panelists for accepting uh, to uh, share their expertise on the uh, model uh, rules. Now, on behalf of UNIDRA in particular, I would like to express gratitude to Eli for organizing this event in the prestigious framework of the annual General Assembly. Uh, more generally for the excellent year-long cooperation in this project, uh, which started with uh, Christiane Wendehos, who was uh, already mentioned by, by Diana, and with our former Secretary General, I would like also to recall Angelo Estrella Faria. 
Uh, now uh, we have uh, um, in front of us the completed rules and comments. And let me stress the importance of reading uh, the comments together with the black letter rules for this type of soft law in order to better understand the rules themselves, but also their interaction and the checks and balances of the set of rules. And I'm sure that this is a topic that will be uh, addressed in, in later uh, interventions. We have the text both in English and French, and let me um, uh, recall the work done on the black letter rules in French by what we call the French uh, group within the uh, structure group, uh, Loïc Cadier, Frédéric Ferrand, and Emmanuel Jolin. And I must say that I too cannot hide uh, some emotion in seeing that we are almost there. We need the approval of the Unidra Governing Council, but the Unidra Governing Council has already seen previous drafts and commented uh, on them. So I only have two short points. Uh, before leaving the floor to the panelists. One is on the origin of the project, and Diana already referred to that. And the second one is on the architecture of the project. And from the words of Diana, it looks perhaps complex and daunting, but it was necessary to, to achieve this goal. So on the origin, I would like to recall that this all started as an idea of uh, the Secretary General at the time and uh, Christiane Wendehorst for the implementation and adaptation to a regional dimension of the American Law Institute UNIDRA principles of transnational civil procedure. And we have here uh, Rolf Stuhner, uh, uh, Professor Stuhner was a co-reporter in that project. Now, this is why most rules start with a reference to one or more Ali UNIDRA principles. But of course, the drafters had to consider a much wider array of sources, including European national laws, supranational regulation, and Diana has already referred to the active participation of the EU institutions as observers in the project, as well as international instruments. And uh, here I would like to mention our sister organization, the uh, HCCH, who participated uh, as an observer in the project. So this is a regional instrument, therefore, it's a model rules for Europe, but in a way it has also a global dimension because of its origin and potentially because of, of its use as model, uh, why not for other jurisdictions. The second and last point is on the complex architecture. And I would like to invite you to look at the first pages of the uh, draft instrument uh, with the list of all participants of the experts that join us. Uh, Diana already referred to the steering committee, nine working groups working in successive waves, one overarching structure group, observers of different organizations, advisors, so the first reason why I mentioned this is to give all authors their due because that was a huge collective effort. They generously invested their expertise and energy in the project and we are very grateful. We are very fortunate to have them uh, on board. But the second reason, and that's the last point I will make, is that I would like to underline the diversity of the input that went into the, the rules. Participants from all over Europe with a varied legal background, which was an enormous richness. It was also an enormous challenge in finding common rules. And I hope that the discussion that we will have today will both uh, show the richness and uh, the challenge uh, of uh, this set of, uh, of rules that uh, we, we are presenting today. Uh, thank you very much. And I would like now to uh, give the floor again to uh, Diana Wallace uh, in order for her to present our uh, panelists. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, as we've said many times, uh, we hope that the end of this project is, is not the end of our chance to work together and uh, to meet. And I'm sure that goes uh, for many participants. Now, for our panel uh, tonight, we have uh, four panelists, all of whom I will introduce briefly now uh, before handing the floor to the first. 
Um, so we have with us Professor Paul Oberhammer, who is a professor at, at the uh, Faculty of Law at the University of uh, Vienna. Uh, of course, the university that hosts the European Law Institute. So welcome. And we have John Sarabchi, uh, a barrister, Senior Judicial Institute Fellow at University College London and a visiting professor at uh, Paris de, uh, University in France. We have, of course, Professor Rolf Stoner, uh, Professor of Law at the University of Freiburg. And lastly, but by no means least, we have, as it were, our outside uh, discussant and that is Marco de Benito, who is the Jean Monnet Chair in European Civil Procedure at the IE University in Madrid. So welcome everybody. We're looking forward to a fascinating uh, discussion on our rules. And Professor Paul Oberhammer, the floor is yours to start. Thank you very much, uh, Diana and Anna. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, I've been asked to say a few words on the interests and the shareholders involved when it comes to an approximation or even unification of procedural law in Europe. I do believe that this is a subject worth thinking about because people involved in the process of lawmaking in Europe usually uh, are used to being part of a process in which European law and its scope, the scope of European law is constantly extended. Of course, with the speed of the process changing from one period to the other. And we usually believe that a deeper integration is normally or even always a good thing. I personally agree that this is basically true. Constantly deepening the integration is a part of this, of the DNA, so to say, of this project of peace and prosperity, which we call the European Union. However, this is so to say, an idealistic approach and uh, we are, should be aware that uh, this approach is not shared by everybody so it might be useful to have additional arguments for the approximation or unification of procedural law in Europe. After all civil procedure is a pretty practical and technical thing and therefore having some more down-to-earth arguments might be useful when it comes to uh, advocating such unification. When I thought about a title for my short presentation, I was tempted to call it uh, Uniform Procedure in Europe and its Enemies. So who might be against uniform procedure? And in particular, what kinds of argument, arguments can we expect from such uh, opponents or even enemies? Of course, there are people and political movements who are enemies of the European integration process as such. I'm not going to touch upon this because everybody is very well aware of these developments that are going on right now. Some of you may know that I was a professor in Switzerland before I came to Austria. To be more precise, I worked there in exactly the period when the new Uniform Code of Civil Procedure for Switzerland, the first Uniform Code of Civil Procedure for Switzerland was drafted and then enacted. Accordingly, I had plenty of opportunity to watch how people responded to the idea of Uniform Civil Procedure. Normally, many members of the judiciary will be skeptical about this idea, at least skeptical, sometimes even openly hostile. Their typical argument, or one of the typical arguments, refers to legal culture. A certain code of the procedure or a certain court practice is said to be the expression or an important part of a certain legal culture of a nation or jurisdiction. Sometimes people believe that talking about uh, a legal culture is a very educated approach to the law as it adds, so to say, a flavor of uh, social science and the humanities to uh, the legal discussion. Although often, however, referring to legal culture is only a camouflage for your own personal or national idiosyncrasies. For example, the Swiss discussion, it was an important issue whether, for example, there would be uniform names for appellate courts or whether these names would remain the same in each and every part of Switzerland. In this context, legal culture was used as an argument. If something like this happens, you always should ask, whose culture are you referring to? And most of the times, the true answer would be, well, not the culture of a society as a whole, 
as people and businesses normally do not care at all about these details that others call their legal culture. Or to be more precise, they simply do not know about these details because they do not care and why should they? So when we address legal culture here, we normally do not speak about the culture of a nation, a state, in its inhabitants or citizens. We talk about the habits of a rather small group of people who are comfortable with their habits and do not want to change them. These people are mainly judges and sometimes attorneys. Unfortunately, these are also the people who are the specialists in civil procedure and might be therefore in a position to discuss unification of civil procedure in Europe. One might think that maybe academics might be the ones to get the specialists out of their comfort zone. After all, professors have been advocating approximation of civil procedure for quite a while, and most of the specialists involved in the work of the Eli Unidra working group in our project are professors as well. Unfortunately, I have to make two observations or rather reservations in this context. On the one hand, I have witnessed a certain coincidence over and over again, both in the course of our project and in other discussions on comparative civil procedure. A professor will suggest a certain solution. When confronted with the fact that this is simply the solution of his or her own home jurisdiction, the answer will normally be, well, it is only a coincidence that this is solution from back home is the most convincing one. This is the behavior of the open-minded pro-European academic and maybe in uh, subsequent discussions with people from other jurisdictions who are also of the opinion that their national approach is the uh, realistic, the rational one, such a person might change their minds. Others who do not show up or very often at conferences or seminars like that belong to the most ardent defenders of legal culture childishly defending their own little treasure trove of the stuff they know by heart and say in their lectures just the way their forefathers did. As you all know, the work we do in the creation of an area of freedom and justice and security is ever not meant to be serving the comfort of judges or academics, but rather the interest of the citizen. Let us assume that this citizen is interested in the rule of law, and this is because this is what protects his liberty and uh, his property. And this rule of law is mainly based on foreseeability. At least Friedrich von Hayek said so, and after all, he's the only Viennese lawyer who was ever awarded a Nobel Prize. Some might argue that traditional notions of civil procedure provide for such foreseeability as there is established court practice and all that, or maybe even case law. This is of course true to some extent, and then again, not at all. If you look uh, at arbitration, one might believe that the low degree of regulation of the process might result in a lot of surprises. The opposite, opposite is true. Businesses opt for arbitration exactly because they want to avoid the unpleasant surprises they know from national judiciaries. There are reasons for that. First, one can argue that uh, can argue whether an established court practice or even case law makes procedure more foreseeable or only very complicated and as a consequence not foreseeable. For example, to give you an example from my jurisdiction, in Austrian court practice, there are very complicated and detailed traditions and court practices on how to argue the grounds for an appeal, and you're not convincing if we do not follow this practice. This practice is so complicated that even most Austrian attorneys struggle to get it right in many, many cases. And it would be absolutely impossible for a foreign lawyer to formulate a correct appeal according to that Austrian court practice. They might be able to say exactly what they think is wrong with the first instance judgment, both on a factual and a legal basis, but they might fail to say it, so to say, the Austrian way. With this, I have arrived at the second uh, most important and final aspect. For a foreign citizen or business, every foreign procedure is full of unpleasant surprises. What makes sense for the practitioner of one jurisdiction is an unpleasant parochial and arbitrary surprise for those from another and vice versa. If you want to get, if you want to get rid of such surprises, we have to strive for uniform civil procedure. Of course, not for any uniformity, but for a uniform procedure that makes sense across the border. For that, one should discuss solutions that make sense 
for people from different jurisdictions. And that is exactly what happened in the course of our ELI Unidor project. Those who know me uh, will understand that I do not wish to end my little presentation in an overly optimistic fashion. I've told you about my Swiss experience. They had uniform civil procedure for 10 years now, and still it makes a huge difference whether you have to try your case in, let's say, Geneva or in Zurich, simply because of the style of the courts remained quite different. I've also told you about the intricate uh, details of Austrian court practice on how to exactly frame an appeal. This practice has almost no basis in the law and could not be changed simply by changing the law. Most of it is just how you do it over here. So for all of you who care about legal culture, we, we personally will probably not live to see the day where all those idiosyncrasies of civil procedure go away but we can work to provide uh, future generations with a more rational and more foreseeable civil procedure in this area of justice, which is said to be serving the citizen. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Paul. If we can now pass to John, please. Thank you very much, Diana. Thank you, Paul, as well. Uh, it is a pleasure to have been asked to take part in this panel today, just as it's been a pleasure to work with so many distinguished colleagues, and particularly, as was mentioned earlier, latterly with Rolf over the course of this work. Um, I think that it's true to say that I've appeared on a panel discussing this project at every Ely annual conference since, since its inception. And that includes a year when I wasn't even supposed to, but had to step in at the 11th hour. Um, because of unavoidable circumstances with another speaker. Um, so it's with a great degree of regret and perhaps some relief that I won't have to do this again um, as the project draws happily to a successful conclusion. Over the next 10 minutes or so, um, I want to take this opportunity to outline the project's history and the intentions which underpinned it, to set the scene really um, for what Marco and Rolf are going to say shortly. Now, as Diana mentioned, the project started as long ago as 2013, a joint exploratory workshop in Vienna organised by Ely and Unidra kicked things off. The intention at that time was to identify a limited number of areas of civil procedure, including enforcement. Um, where it was believed progress could be made on developing a model European approach. Now enforcement fell at the wayside at that stage. It was considered to be a subject worthy of a project of its own. And perhaps now, and I'm not making any suggestions, but perhaps now that this project has completed, um, the time is right for enforcement to move to centre stage for Ely and possibly for Unidra as well. Based on the conclusions, though, reached at that 2013 workshop and following further discussions between the two organisations in 2014, it was agreed that a joint project would initially consider the development of European rules, model European rules of civil procedure in a modest number of discrete areas. They were at the time access to information and evidence, provisional and protective measures and service of documents, including due notice of proceeding. It was a modest approach. Specific areas such as appeals, costs, funding and collective redress were ruled out at the beginning on the basis that they were too problematic. They didn't suggest a successful outcome. As the project progressed, however, given the success of the collaborative approach taken by its working parties and their members and the degree to which agreed rules and solutions were achieved, the project scope expanded even to cover those areas apart from enforcement that were ruled out at the start. Ultimately, the project has covered all areas of civil procedure from pre-issue to appeals and costs and funding of litigation. The upshot was wider in scope than could have been hoped for at the start, even if that was an aspiration and stated perhaps of the project. A fully, fully realized set of model rules of civil procedure became the aim and has been achieved. 
And if I can borrow from the great civil proceduralist, the late Marcel Stormer, whose work inspired and informed the project, a cathedral was built. One which, as, my, as Professor Stirner um, noted in 2013, produced a common vision or idea of a European procedural model. And that model which the project seek to achieve was to be a workable, practical text rather than a perfect academic work. More the later Wittgenstein than Tractatus Wittgenstein um, for those in Vienna. No doubt there will be other such cathedrals in the future which will build on and improve on Ely Unidraft model rules. That is as inevitable as it is to be welcomed. Welcomed because the project's primary aim was to produce a set of rules that would serve as an inspiration for future development, which could, as both Ely and Unidrad desire, improve the quality of lawmaking, as well as help to increase procedural co convergence or coherence across Europe and the European Union. What the project did not aim to do was to produce the last word, the final word, an absolute definitive template, even if such a thing were desirable or possible. In seeking to devise a set of rules that would serve as an inspiration for the future, it was agreed at the outset of the project that it would not adopt a minimum standards approach to drafting. It was understood that that would yield no real positive development. Rather, the approach to drafting the rules themselves was one which sought best practice. A best practice approach was taken. Now it did so, as we have heard already, by drawing on a breadth of different sources. It also drew on developments in technology, although the drafting strived to be technology neutral in its approach, not least given the speed of development and potential for change which technology carries with it, particularly at the moment. And given recent developments in technology use in procedure in our courts as a consequence of the COVID-19 pandemic, that appears to be a particularly wise policy choice by the project. To give one example though of the best practice approach taken, reference can be made to the rules drafted on case management. Rather than considering whether case management should focus on procedure only, as in the common law, or both substance and procedure, as in, for instance, Austria, the rules eschew the distinction. Rule 7, for instance, accepts, which, sorry, which sets out the general case management obligation, on the contrary, accepts that the two are functionally interdependent. And the better approach is one which looks to the court's role in assisting the parties and the party's role in assisting the court to reach substantively correct decisions. Now, in developing this approach, the model rules articulated what has been described as a partnership or a cooperative model of civil proceedings and case management, focused around the duty of loyal cooperation, which still seems strange um, for me to say, um, as it's not entirely an expression that would be used in English um, procedure or English generally, um, but the duty of loyal cooperation, nevertheless, between the court and the parties took centre place in terms of case management. An idea that was particularly championed by, and I have to give the credit here, to Remco Van Rey and Alan Uzelac, um, who, who pushed very strongly for this idea of loyal cooperation. Further, in terms of developing this idea of case management, the, the project developed the idea that it would look at case management commencing before proceedings through the adoption of pre-commencement and thereafter continuing obligations which require parties to cooperate with each other and particularly to cooperate with each other before proceedings commence to seek to settle their disputes consensually and the court here the role for that is to help them to help facilitate such endeavors but only once proceedings have commenced now in part these developments are not novel they can be trend traced to Franz Klein they can be found in Norwegian civil procedure and in other, although not all, procedural codes and rules across Europe. To some, they may be controversial, to some they may be anodyne, but they may, in terms of controversial controversiality, shall I say, um, particularly um, give rise to concern or 
to debate in respect of the idea of procedural rules applying to pre-commencement of party activity. Now this was an area where there was much discussion in the working group that prepared the rules. It concluded, however, that best practice would require formalising in the rules such an approach because it properly cohered with the idea of a partnership between the court and the parties to promote a proportionate litigation process. One of the aims identified in the general principle which commenced the rules, um, I think in rule one to nine. To some though, the rules as Paul has outlined may not cohere with their procedural culture or tradition. Reforming procedural culture is thankfully outside the scope of the project. The working group that devised case management rules and the project as a whole was alive to this issue though. And the conclusion that they drew was that the best practice approach, while mindful of its sources, of those traditions, of those cultures, could not be limited by them. Not be limited by those traditions or those cultures. Now, throughout the rules, such points can be made. Now, it is hoped that the approach taken that such points as those in respect of case management will raise questions, raise debate and discussion, and will challenge our traditions, and hopefully lead to the development of new cultures and new traditions, and in that way helps to inspire future reform across Europe, and hopefully secure, over time, the greater coherence and convergence the project seeks to achieve. Now, if it does so, this project would have gone a long way to achieving its ultimate aim, its ultimate intention to improve European civil procedural law. Thank you very much. Thank you, John, for setting the scene, as, as you said, but also going uh, much more further into looking at some of the features of the rules themselves. And uh, without further ado, let me um, pass the floor, give the floor to Marco De Benito, who is the next speaker, uh, and as an, ex an external speaker who will um, raise questions and comments on uh, the rules. Benito. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Don't, don't worry. Uh, uh, I'd like to start by, by expressing my gratitude to Diana Wallace and yourself, Anna, for this invitation. Uh, but sitting uh, here today together with uh, some of the main voices of uh, this, uh, behind this historical project is, is an immense honor for me, really. So thank you. Um, so I'd like to uh, follow up uh, to build on and some of uh, John's comments, mainly on case management powers. Uh, John mentioned the court's case, case management powers, also mentioned this uh, loyal cooperation that uh, ends there. I'd like to I think it can be nice to uh, uh, focus now on the party's power. Uh, let's review those powers throughout uh, the rules. First of all, the dispositions principle, the party initiative, that's uh, reaffirmed in the rules. Parties institute proceedings, they determine the scope of the dispute. They can even waive remedies, provisional measures, appeals. Also the parties uh, frame not only the facts, but they can even agree on the legal basis for the claim. And this agreement binds the court. That's uh, literally what I read in rule 26. Also it's for the parties to offer evidence. Now the court can invite the parties to supplement their offer of evidence, to suggest evidence. Again, I'm literally reading here rules 2592. They can do that, but they uh, only exceptionally can they uh, take evidence on its own motion. Also, parties can seek access to evidence orders at any time, even pre-commencement, also as John was pointing out. And not only document production, but any means of evidence, witness or party depositions, investigations leading to an expert report, perhaps very powerful weapons, of course, uh, under the control of the court, but in, in the, uh, the initiative is, is with the parties, right? Um, it's the actual taking of evidence, the external aspects of evidence, we may say, so that begin to fall primarily in the court's hands. So the parties retain control over the innermost aspects of proceedings and only in the outermost uh, layer the, court, the court's role becomes, uh, becomes prevalent. And even then, uh, also as John was saying, case management is not designing the rules and that's apparent from, from, from even a quick reading as a top-down activity, but rather as a dialogue, a um, choreography, if you wish, in which the court, the parties, uh, their counsel dance together. 
And, and, and during that dance, it's not only the court that sets the pace. It can, all, it can also be the parties. Parties can make procedural arrangements, process verträge in the widest sense. And the court cannot depart from them without good reason. Also, literally quoting Rule 50, the court cannot depart from the procedural agreements of the parties without good reason. Actually, the first provision, the first real provision of the rules, because uh, rule number one is about the scope of the rules, is rule two. And rule two starts with the parties. Parties, the lawyers, and the court, in that order, parties, the lawyers, and the court must cooperate. And then it goes on, rule three, tells parties and lawyers to contribute to the proper management of the proceedings. So um, the management, party management is there together with the court case management powers. It's not that the court's powers are increased or decreased at the expense of those of the parties. What increases, seems to me, is the overall flexibility of the system. What sets the tone of the rules, from my reading, are sentences such as, uh, the following, whenever necessary and appropriate, the court must order this or that. This appears in several um, articles, several of the rules. And this is, I find interesting because uh, the need for procedural certainty, for, some, for, for procedural rigidity, if you want to put it more negative, uh, in a more negative tone, a fixed pattern of phases and deadlines defined by the legislature, if possible in a detailed and comprehensive manner. This idea is deeply ingrained in some legal cultures. Let's take uh, the Ali Unidra principles, the American Law Institute and Unidra principles that Anna uh, Veneziano was, uh, was mentioning before. And I'm speaking here above, uh, here above under Professor Stürner's control. As, as, as several times I'm speaking, they draw a very clear outline. The pleading phase, the entering phase, and the final phase, that's article uh, nine. And each phase is something concrete, tangible, the, uh, not just in an abstract list. It's something that exists. There's a connection between a what and a when, what to do and when to do it. In the rules, however, even though the choice for a, for a main hearing model that's clear with a preparatory phase and a final hearing, but case management powers are listed, rule 49, this is a, a very important rule in, 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 the, in the rules. Uh, these powers are listed outside any given time frame. So without reference to any particular moment in time, they are listed in an overarching or delocalized manner, so to speak. In other words, the rules avoid, seem to me that they would avoid defining too much that what and when. Case management in the rules isn't therefore more authoritarian or more liberal, but simply looser, more focused on trust. Trust on personal authority, on a sense of initiative, and a sense of prudence, that old Aristotelian virtue, phronesis, the right reason in action, Recta ratio agibilium in Thomas Aquinas' words. Trust on a sense of loyalty and personal responsibility. All this rather than on compliance with a series of specific mandates coming from above. So if powers are being shifted at all, it's not between courts and parties, like in some zero-sum game, but rather from the legislative to the judiciary from central codification committees to each individual judge and lawyer. I see here, maybe in, in big structuralist terms, a certain shift of procedural authority. And this brings me to uh, uh, the different notions of judicial office. I'm using this term uh, borrowed from Damasca, judicial, what, what judges are and what judges do. The professional model against the bureaucratic model and all our underlying cultural and political assumptions and preconceptions. And this might be, if you think of it, this might be one of the most interesting points of the whole project. Not the rules from a technical perspective, but about the project itself. Because the rules are, if they are something other, the, the, the equivalent to a civil procedure code, right? they are like a small civil process ordinary. Not the Juristergesetz, not the judiciary law, not the Gerichtsverfassungsgesetz. The problem is that the notion of judicial office and the organization of courts has implications. Not only in what judges are and their background, their appointment, their career, their relationship with uh, parties, with counsel, with their own staff, 
court management. The notion of judicial office also affects the way civil procedure works. So judicial office and civil procedure are closely intertwined. So if the rules lean towards a professional model, to some extent, if that is the case, having the rules applied by judges of the bureaucratic persuasion, wouldn't that cause a certain degree of cognitive dissonance? For instance, uh, in the regulation of appeals, the court has discretion to grant or deny permi permission to appeal. But many conceive uh, the first appeal, berufung, uh, appel, uh, appel or appellation, as a losing party's right to a second instance, basically. And in the rules, the grounds for appeal, for that very first appeal, which are fundamental significance, development of the law, public interest in uniform adjudication, that's rule 166, a controversial one, I, I, I think, or that will or may be controversial. Those three grounds for appeal are associated in the minds of many with last resorts appeal with uh, Supreme Courts, not so much with uh, ordinary mid-level courts of appeal. So one might ask, are the rules advocating a system of double cassation, double cassation, or more precisely, double revision, as it operates uh, through open standards, as it's in Germany, through general clauses? And if the focus is on uniformity, then having a myriad of uh, regional, uh, uh, provincial, state, uh, little Supreme Courts, isn't there a certain contradiction in terms, certain uh, contradiction in terms? And more, if the first appeal is all about uniformity and, and, and law development, how can we achieve those ends unless by infusing even a drop or two of a star de Jesus principle to the system? And wouldn't that mean in turn, because again, everything is uh, intertwined, uh, a shift or at least a reassessment of the role of the judiciary in our legal systems? Or maybe it's me that I'm being the, the victim of my own preconceptions, preconceptions and, and cognitive dissonance here. This might very well be the case, but we are lucky that Professor Stuhner will now settle all these doubts, so I don't need to worry much. I hope I didn't overdo my role as a devil, uh, de devil's advocate. So let me once again express uh, my sincerest admiration for what already is a landmark in the history of uh, procedural science. Thank you very much. Marco, thank you very much uh, for some very thought-provoking uh, comments, uh, but I'm sure Rolf will be well able uh, to deal with the issues that you have r raised. Uh, Rolf, the floor is yours. Thank you. Should Hi, hi, how do I come in? I don't understand. You are already on screen. We can hear your voice. Everything is fine. Yes, good. So, uh, let me first say that it is my pleasure to have some of the most important persons <laughs> here together to discuss uh, the final stage of our project. And let me also say that, so I am relatively old and did a lot of discussions in the civil procedure. It was always my impression that uh, I learned a lot during this project <laughs> over uh, on, on other uh, legal cultures. And uh, uh, sometimes I had to change my mind, yes, and uh, to uh, adapt to other ideas. Yeah. What is the core, uh, the, the core element of this uh, rules? In my eyes, it's the duty of the court to give hints and feedback, to enable parties to develop their case upon knowledge of the court's preliminary assessment of the factual, evidential, and legal issues, 
and of still lacking factual assertions or evidential offers necessary for a success of the party's case in the eyes of the court. It is in the end, it was already mentioned, the idea of a dialogical uh, civil procedure, a, a dialogical interaction between parties and court, which underlies these rules. If the court does not fulfill its duty to monitor lacking facts and evidence, the court is not permitted to draw negative conclusions. Thus is to protect parties from judicial arbitrariness and uh, it is not possible for the court to forbid uh, unfair preclusion or uh, to, to, to disregard late effectual or evidential contentions in first or even second instance, lacking careful monitoring of the court. And this is a form of a well-working balance between judge and parties. Uh, judges should not be authoritarian. They should be cooperative. And it is my experience that it is very rare that uh, lawyers refuse cooperation when it is offered yeah, by a judge. Uh, and therefore, I would put emphasis on this dialogical character, which uh, is the source of a a sound balance between parties and court competences. Now, uh, there were some uh, remarks of Marco on the uh, structure of the proceedings. And when I understood, uh, understood you in the right way, you were pleased to uh, to see that we have a very flexible rules, yeah, and no rules which are short and point in uh, setting uh, dates and uh, in uh, in give the court the possibility to give strict orders to parties what they have to do. Uh, you also made a remark on the interim phase, a very short remark when I remember in the right way. Uh, the interim phase is perhaps the most important uh, phase of this, uh, 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 this uh, uh, structure because in this uh, stage of proceedings, uh, the parties are able to complement their uh, means of evidence, yeah? And they are also able to uh, improve their factual assertions. This rule is, uh, this uh, stage is very flexible. There is no clear differentiation between disclosure and taking evidence. In this part, there is room for disclosure and at the same time for taking evidence. And sometimes uh, disclosure and taking evidence are uh, completely, uh, uh, so you, you, you cannot make a, a, a clear decision, yeah? What is disclosure and evidence? For example, uh, if uh, you have witness statements, there are no real depositions, there are only witness statements in this model. And uh, this witness statement may in part replace the main examination when taking evidence. Yes, so it's a, a so it's the old a strict uh, differentiation between disclosure and evidence 
is abandoned and when I am right, it is all also in part abandoned in the legal uh, procedural culture where this differentiation comes from, that's England, yes. Because uh, it's no longer possible even in English civil procedure to make a, a clear differentiation. Now, uh, you, uh, 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 Marco Di Benito, your uh, remark on the personality on judges, of, of judges, was very interesting. Uh, indeed, uh, the idea of a judge is very demanding, which, which underlies his rules. The judge shouldn't be authoritarian and bureaucratic. Yeah? He, he should be a real partner of the parties, at least so long as the parties don't uh, obstruct yes, and uh, uh, play a fair game and uh, don't uh, become unfair. Uh, there is one thing which is mentioned only in the comments, I think. The idea of a well-working community between parties and court, and especially between parties, is a bit ide idealistic yeah? and is in the end not the reality. Parties in civil procedure, each of them want to be the winner, and so there is a competition between parties to convince the court of, uh, the, of the factual basis of their case and to convince the court of the uh, correctness of their legal uh, uh, of their of their of their legal theory underlying their cases, and the principles of uh, cooperation is the principle of cooperation is uh, concretized in the rules uh, by special. Uh, duties of the parties. This is a duty to uh, facilitate settlement. Yeah, it's a duty to uh, disclose evidence in favor of the opponent, and it is also the duty to act fairly. Uh, so uh, these rules are realistic. There are no uh, more or less romantic idea of a, of a, of a, a, a community working together, especially regarding the relationship between parties. I was really surprised, uh, Marco Di Benito said you were relatively uh, yeah, convinced of these rules. So you were a bit skeptic about the uh, realization in uh, national uh, uh, procedural codes. It is true that uh, this uh, model of civil procedure is a relative new phenomenon uh, because it is, in my eyes, the result of uh, the development towards democracy in more than uh, more than only one <laughs> uh, European country, or perhaps two, if we take France, uh, during the last decades. And in my eyes, this model uh, reflects uh, the uh, elements of a, of a, a proceeding which is adequate to democracies, yes, and uh, which takes care of the parties as a real, real subjects of personal dignity, yes, and not of objects of a, of a, a technical procedure, yeah. 
Uh, and this is a, a demanding uh, problem uh, in the future. Uh, the question will be whether the, uh, a, a, a personal meeting between the judge and parties and the lawyers will be the future or whether it will be a meeting like this where we could see us and we hear us speak, but we have no real personal impression. And I don't think that future generations uh, don't need a real personal uh, meeting in the real world. I don't believe that they will be content with meetings in the virtual world where, where, as we have it now. Uh, but a danger may be that uh, orality and personal presence in civil procedure could diminish more and more and in the end disappear. Uh, and this would go back to a state we had in the learned procedure where parties didn't make the acquaintance of the judges and the court, the real acquaintance. And this would be re re regrettable, but uh, the younger generations in part <laughs> may have a different point of view. Good, so I could finish. I didn't use my prepared manuscript and I have to excuse for some uh, problems in being very fluent. Uh, and uh, now we should use the time for questions of the uh, other uh, participants. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Rolf. Um, we have at the moment a couple of questions. Um, the first is from our colleague Vincent Smith, who was a member of one of the uh, working groups um, and he asks about the, um, the, the proposals to disseminate uh, our work and now clearly we had hoped we would be having some sort of formal dissemination event uh, later this autumn but because of the pandemic that seems unlikely um, and so that idea is on hold uh, until early next year. But of course, Anna may wish to say something about the Unidwar event uh, at the end of this month, which whilst there is also a, a formal meeting to look at the rules and hopefully to approve them, there is also a subsequent event uh, where they will uh, be discussed. And I have no doubt that each and every one of us will be doing various things once the rules are finalized to make sure that they um, receive wider, wider circulation. Uh, and both institutions, I am sure, likewise. Anna, if, if you would wish to add something. Yes, thank you, Diana, and thank you, Vincent. This is a, a, a very good question because the problem with, uh, with soft law and with all kinds of uh, uniform law instruments is, uh, of course, to reach an agreement, to reach a, 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 a good text, but then also to implement it, to have somebody uh, look at it and, uh, and consider uh, whether to, uh, to use it or not and in, in, in what way. So um, as Diana said, the, um, the situation we are living uh, in, at the moment made it very difficult to, to reach out nationally um, and to, to be very effective in this, uh, uh, in, in this way. And also the rules have not yet been approved by UNIDRA and therefore we have to wait for, for that and for the final publication. Um, but uh, it is our intention to reach out uh, in, in different uh, uh, jurisdictions and to have uh, different events. And one of the target groups is certainly national judiciary, judiciaries, but I would like to, um, um, to recall that there will be an event also at the closing session of the uh, 
closing day of the session of the UNIDRA Governing Council in September on the 25th. And this event, which is also in the format of a webinar, will feature other uh, participants in the project, but also external participants. And uh, at least two of them have uh, a, a judicial background, and so they will be able to uh, interact with us uh, in, in, in this respect. Uh, Diana, I see that there are also other questions. Maybe uh, you would like to um, turn this question to uh, uh, our panelists or to begin answering yourself. No, we have a, a question from Clara Farleitner um, who asks um, how we dealt with the adaptation from different national European jurisdictions and how this played a role in the outcome of the rules. I don't know if John, you would like to make a start with that? Sure. Um, it's a very interesting question. Um, sometimes it's difficult to find intersections between the different jurisdictions to form a final rule. Uh, that, that is an interesting point, an interesting question. Um, generally speaking, um, I think we found that it wasn't all that difficult most of the time to reach a consensus on what the best approach to drafting was and what the optimum rule was. There were a number of occasions though, and I'm sure this is the case in each of the working parties, where specific issues uh, were discussed where, um, uh, to, to, to refer back to what Paul said at the beginning, um, people brought their traditions with them and didn't leave them at the door and argued from the position of what they knew rather than considered um, what might be best um, and what um, may have benefits from the approaches that other jurisdictions and traditions um, uh, did. Um, I think generally though, when, when those type of issues did arise, and, and to give you an example, um, one of the areas where it did, from my perspective, I suppose, was in terms of the judgments group, um, particularly in respect of um, how to deal with the question of the, of the common law summary judgment, default judgment, and, and how that cohered with approaches in other jurisdictions. Um, and I think the answer um, really came from, um, I suppose, the, the, the members of that working group and, and Rolf particularly convincing me that actually the, the position to take was to look at, at the function, um, what was being, what the procedure sought to achieve, rather than focusing on what you particularly did, where you came from, and what your tradition did. Um, so I think generally where there were difficult intersections between different jurisdictions, actually the way that we got around it was through discussing and through focusing on purpose and function and trying to see um, beyond the label and beyond the procedural rule that we were, we were familiar with. Um, and I think if you, if you look through the rules, I, I think from memory, there is only one rule or a handful of rules throughout the entirety of the, of the work where um, a, an option is left open. So the rule provides two different versions of what can be done. Um, and I think it's only in those respects um, that you might say that the differences couldn't be ironed out. Um, but if you were to say that, I think even there you would be mis misinterpreting the provision. I think though where we have rules where there are options open. That's because the working party came to the conclusion that no one particular approach was the best approach, the optimum approach, and that it could be left to individual um, uh, design, individual rulemakers, policy makers in the future um, to, to take the decision what they saw was the most effective provision. So I think generally speaking, I'd say that we overcame any particular um, difficult issues um, through the discussion and through considering a variety of different jurisdictions um, across the, 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 the seven years that we've been working. Um, I don't know whether Rolf um, or anybody else has, has, has a comment to add to that. Thank you. Rolf, would you uh, like to come in? Uh, I think uh, some procedural provisions we formulated were not really taken from special uh, uh, procedural cultures, but the idea came mainly from one culture. For example, the idea to make a part with uh, principles 
this idea uh, was uh, accepted on the pattern of, of the French uh, civil code with this uh, uh, principe directeur, yes, for example. And the idea of the, the pre-commencement duties to settle cases, there were some uh, some uh, uh, continental uh, proceedings which had uh, cautious steps towards this idea. But it was first really realized in, in the English civil procedure with the pre-action protocols, yes, that's also clear, yeah. And, and so it, it's not nas nationalistic uh, to mention this uh, and to, for, for some little uh, procedural cultures to be proud of ideas, why not? But it's always necessary to, uh, as you already mentioned, to discuss a function. Is it acceptable or not? Yes, and it, it makes no sense to, to, uh, uh, to uh, follow forms of, of uh, or kinds of, of, of legal nationalism or, or, or local patriotism. Uh, sometimes it, we could feel that this happened, but it was rare. Yes? Uh, normally all the participants of the project were aware of the fact that uh, a functional uh, approach would be necessary. Thank you, Rolf. And uh, I, we are very aware of the time. We know that our uh, webinar is, uh, is almost uh, getting to its end, uh, but uh, we would like to invite maybe uh, Paul to uh, intervene at, at, the, at this point, if you have any other comments or um, uh, ideas or based on the questions or based on the discussion that we had until now. Well, I, I can only underline what uh, Professor Stöhner has said about uh, uh, mastering the different approaches of different uh, jurisdictions. I think it is important to understand that it was not the nature of the project to simply compile uh, on a comparative basis uh, national solutions and then make a choice to take either one or the other or to find out that they're basically all the same or find some, some, some tiny, tiny common ground. Um, it was more a informed dialogue of uh, people from different jurisdictions explaining to each other uh, the concepts and solutions uh, they know from their uh, jurisdictions. And on that basis, a very intense and a seven year long discussion um, on how to uh, reach such uh, principles uh, and uh, rules that have now been, uh, so to say, codified uh, by the project. So. This is not a comparative handbook on European civil procedure, but rather the outcome of a long intensive dialogue of people from jurisdictions from all over Europe, bringing to the table their experiences, their concepts, and then competing for the best solution. And I think as such, it needs to be understood. And therefore the question is not which of the national systems succeeded, or how did, did, we, did we master a situation where there was no common ground, um, it was not about winning or losing, it was not about uh, looking for common ground and getting desperate where there is not, uh, not no common ground. It was rather about a competition, uh, a dialogue of ideas, um, and finally agreeing upon uh, the best solution, which makes, makes sense, as I said in my little presentation, not only within one system, but across the border. Thank you. Thank you very much and thank you everybody uh, for your participation all of those that you have been watching and listening to us this evening uh, we've had some nice comments thank you very very much thank you to all our panelists thank you dear Anna I'm sure our cooperation will continue and with all of you um, and I wish you a very pleasant end to the evening thank you Many thanks from me as well, and especially to the panelists and also to the or organizers of, of the webinar. It was not easy this year, but it went very well. Thank you uh, from, uh, from us all. Thank you. And have a nice evening. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Bye.
Bye-bye. Bye.